everybody. Uh, welcome to part two of uh, this little series on river dynamics in which we are uh, learning about the behavior of rivers. So in part one, we were most interested in just making some observations. What did we see happening here? In this video, we just want to be able to come to some reasonable inferences about what rivers are doing. To help with some of those observations, I'm going to turn on our riverbed again, and I'm going to point out a few of the observations that I notice, and maybe what do some of these things mean. So let me turn on our water source, and we will get to work. Okay, so we've got our river running, we've got our water source, see that the water is running from the right side of your screen to the left side. And uh, there's a couple of things that I notice right away. One of the things that I notice is that different parts of the stream seem to be doing different processes. So if you look up here at the headwaters on the right side, what I notice is that sediment that used to be here has been carried away. And you might know a name for that. Uh, it's called erosion. So we have erosion that is taking place along the, the right side of the stream, the headwaters, uh, up here where the water is coming from. Down here, at the left side of your screen, it's a pretty different situation. What it looks like to me is that we have something else going on here. We have sediment that was up here, and it has been deposited down at the mouth of the stream. This is called deposition. And so we see that we've got erosion happening up here, we have deposition happening down here. And we see that there's a lot of erosion going on right here. But over on this side, that's a little bit closer to you, I don't think I see any erosion going on over there right now. And then right about here, what I notice is that uh, the sediment doesn't seem to be eroded, but it also doesn't seem to be deposited. It's just sort of traveling along for a certain stretch of the stream. And so this is a term we might not know. Um, it's called transportation. So we have erosion up here. We have transportation kind of here in the middle and then we have deposition down here at the end. And there is actually a special graph called a Heelstrom curve that demonstrates this relationship between what the water is doing and what the sediment is doing. Um, we don't need to worry about that in the scope of this video, but we'll probably see it later. Now, if you look at a map, we find evidence of all of these processes, especially down here where we have deposition going on. This is a part of the river that sometimes creates a structure. Um, so some parts of this, if it's underwater, we call it a submarine fan. If it's up here on land, the sort of these areas that have been created by the deposition, this is called a river delta. It's called a river delta because it's kind of a triangular shape. And the Greek letter delta is actually a triangle. So a question that I have is, why are different processes happening at different parts of the river? How come we have erosion up here? We have transportation right about here. And then we have deposition happening way down here. Is the water doing something different up here than it's doing down there? Maybe it has something to do with the angle or the velocity or maybe the amount of water that's flowing per second. There's something else really fascinating here. This is my favorite thing about rivers. Do you notice that even in the time that I've been talking to you, the river has not stayed put. It has kind of wiggled from straight down the middle to the far side to the near side. It's sort of like waving around. And there's a name for this. It's called meandering. This river is meandering from left to right. This is something else that you can find in a map, are these sort of wiggles where the, the river will, will wiggle around. So we call those meanders. And I want to point on this area right here. So the river at one time, we can tell that the river used to be here and it has left. The river has abandoned this part of the river channel. This is an abandoned channel. And you can see how there's actually a little bit of water that remains in this channel. It's kind of sitting here. These are almost like little lakes. And this is something else you'll find on a map. They're called Oxbow Lakes. It's an abandoned channel that the river at one time was in and it has since left and gone someplace else. So you'll find these funny little horseshoe shaped lakes near a, a river in the, the floodplain. Uh, and those are called Oxbow Lakes. So because of this behavior, sometimes we can find old river channels that have been abandoned by the river. Now, this is all very important and very interesting. I think there's one more thing I wanna do. You might have noticed that trial four of the first part of the series included a bunch of rocks. I think I want to explore a little bit more in depth what happens when moving water and sediment interact with an obstruction, such as a big stone. So I'm going to reset this whole thing and fill it with some stones 
and see what does the water do when it interacts with a stone. So some pretty interesting things happen with our river, uh, even with rocks. One of the things that we see is that the rocks influenced the flow of the water. In general, what we saw was that we had erosion taking place at the front end of the rock, and then we had what appears to be deposition, or maybe transportation, happening at the rear end of the rock. And this happens partly as a result of what's called turbulence, when water forms these little eddies inside the stream. But also of note, is that the stream still meandered, even in the presence of all these rocks which might have influenced the flow of the stream. Why does the river meander? That's a pretty interesting behavior. And why do the rocks influence the flow of the water in the way that we saw them? Why does erosion happen on some parts of the stream, but then we see that deposition happens on other parts of the stream? Let's try to explain some of these behaviors using some good old-fashioned physics. The first question we can address is this. How does a river's velocity influence the processes that happen there? Here's a landscape, complete with mountains, lowlands, and some space between them. In our stream table, the highlands were at the top and the lowlands at the bottom. If you've ever seen a mountainous area, you'd know that they have steeper angles, while lowland areas have a shallower angle or are even totally flat. When it rains or snows in the mountains, that water runs down from the steeper highland areas and flows toward the shallower lowland areas. Now, if you recall from earlier, in the highlands we observed the process of erosion. Sediment is removed from this area. The lowlands are where we observed the process of deposition. Sediment is dropped off here. And in the middle, we saw what we call transportation. Instead of being cut away or added, sediment simply travels through this area. In the highland areas, we find that water moves at a high velocity because of the steeper angle of the landscape. As the water approaches the lowlands, it slows down because of the reduced angle. So if we were to correlate the velocity of the current with the river process that happens there, we'd find that when a river flows at a high velocity, we have the process of erosion, where the water picks up sediment. When the river flows at a low velocity, we have the process of deposition, where the water current can no longer carry the sediment, so it drops it off. Medium velocities result in transportation, in which sediment is just carried along. The next question we can explore is this. Why does a river meander? We saw in our stream table that the river will wave back and forth through the sediments over time. Why does it do this? Well, let's start with a river. Now, any natural river is going to have some slight bends in it, little random curves caused by rocks or the lay of the land, these curves will result in outside bends and inside bends. Now on each bend, the water moves at different velocities. On the outside bend, notice that the water has to travel a farther distance in the same amount of time. That means that outside bends have water that moves at a faster velocity. Inside bends have water moving at a slower velocity because the water has to cover a smaller distance in the same amount of time. We saw a moment ago that high velocity water results in erosion, while low velocity water results in deposition. So the outside bends, because the water is moving faster here, will erode, while the inside bends, slower moving water, will deposit sediment. This process is also easy to observe in actual riverbanks. See how the outside bend was cut away by erosion, while the inside bend grew inward? Let's fast forward through time and see what these competing processes do over a long period. Notice how the river became contorted and twisty in its floodplain. This phenomenon is what we call a meander. The river is meandering as it flows because of the processes of erosion and deposition. The next question we can address is this one. How do those weird oxbow lakes form? These start with the process of meandering. Here we see a single meander in a river. Remember that erosion happens on the outside bends and deposition on the inside bends. 
If we imagine this continuous process happening over time, occasionally we will observe two outside bends touch. When the two bends in the river meet, the water now finds it much easier to flow straight from one side to the other instead of taking the meander. The meander has now been abandoned. Over time, the river continues along its shorter course, almost as though it was never flowing through the meander in the first place. We can watch this process taking place in historical, aerial, and satellite imagery. Lastly, we wondered, how do rocks influence the flowing water in the river? Suppose we have a rock sitting on the riverbed. As the current flows against the rock, the rock bends the water around it. This obstruction creates swirly areas of turbulence called eddies, which often erode the sediment in front of the rock. By the time the water passes the rock, it has slowed down, so any sediment it's carrying is deposited behind the rock. A mass of rocks will even slow down great quantities of water, so sometimes you'll see that people build these big piles of rock on the outside bends of rivers. These piles of rock slow down the water, and this prevents the outside bend from eroding. So between all those observations and inferences and explanations, you know more than the average citizen does about river dynamics. So I hope that you found this instructive and interesting. And until next time, remember, you can learn anything.